Greetings. In 2011, Alzheimer's took my college professor mom. I was familiar with Alzheimer's. It took dad my freshman year. Alzheimer's is a disease that research indicates if you have one parent diagnosed with it, you have a 30% higher chance of getting it. I have two. The year that I took custody of mom and sold the family home, I started my master's in Harvard at, I started my master's in psychology at Harvard. One of the first classes that I took, the class that in retrospect would save my life, was called the psychology of resilience. I learned that we make it back from the depths of despair, from difficult circumstances. We engage in meaningful activities bigger than ourselves. I heard that. I heard that, and as a child of academe, I take direction fairly well. <laughs> I thought a lot about how she was, how she used to be. Her name was Marie. She was diagnosed at 59. Oh, she had presence. She could command a room. Not just in the lecture halls at her beloved Brooklyn College, but wherever she went. She was a giant. Not really that big. A little under five feet. <laughs> but big to me and those whose lives she touched. Not that she couldn't be highly annoying. <laughs> she was my mom first. But what I thought most about, what I thought most about was an emotion that I felt in her presence. An awareness, really. An awareness that I felt no matter my age. I was aware of my safety. In her presence, I felt so protected, I didn't even need to engage in thought. My mom did that for me. Made me feel so safe that I was free to simply be. My mom pivoted. My mind pivoted to the child that does not benefit from innate security, that does not enjoy the luxury of safety and care. A luxury that most of us experience and take for granted. Sure, I was in turmoil. Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's will do that to a family. But when she wasn't behaving, refusing to eat, throwing things, scaring the Bichon poodles, <laughs> or speaking in her newfound tongue that my partner and I agreed sounded a lot like the South African language of Afrikaans. It was at those times that I did my best daydreaming. It was simply too difficult to remain in the present. I thought a lot about the times before Alzheimer's. But what about the foster child? They cannot. By default, their histories are disquieting, cumbersome, and triggering. So I got into volunteering for the court-appointed special advocate's office of the family court in Newark, New Jersey, to be of service, to make a change bigger than myself, to build my resilience and my hope in my time of despair. When Alzheimer's visits your family, I promise you that's a time of despair. Here's what I learned. Here's what I learned on my journey working on behalf of the child raised as a ward of the state. I learned that this demographic has resiliency, survival skills, persistence, and hope that they acquired in difficult times in times of despair. And those experiences that they shared with me actually fostered hope in me. I'm gonna tell you how. I met many foster children, many foster care survivors. Each of them, their journey is left on my soul. CJ and David are just two that come to mind. Born in hospitals and abandoned, on opposite coasts of these United States, by mommies, by mommies who simply couldn't care for them. Each of them born with a job. The first chore for each of these newborns 
was going to be to beat their addictions to heroin and crack cocaine. CJ shared with me why he remains hopeful. Being born addicted to crack cocaine, coming from where I come from, that is reason to hope. When she walked away, she gave me another chance at life. In fact, in fact, my beginnings, my beginnings inform the way that I father my children because I will be the one to end generational poverty and addiction. Each of these stories, each of these stories difficult to hear, abandonment, addiction, neglect, led to perseverance, intentionality, and hope. This multi-layered population, this multi-layered population has to cobble together an array of information from diverse sources and call up that nugget of information at the appropriate times. And there is few opportunity for error. They do not get to make mistakes. They remain hopeful despite being on their own earlier than their general population peers. In most states, it's 18 years old. Theoretically, theoretically, I could argue that they've been on their own their entire lives. Not unlike CJ and David, abandoned at birth, languishing in foster care, waiting, waiting to be wanted. But that hasn't stopped both men from hoping. I am in awe. I am in awe of this population that continues to persist and be an agent on their own journey. My goal, my plan was to be of service to the foster child. The foster child community was actually in service to me. Role modeling, role modeling for me, how to be resilient and hopeful in my time of despair. And hope, hope is contagious. Thank you.